tuning in to the English Journey podcast this week. I am your host, Jasmine from Toronto, Canada. I have been loving all the messages and positive responses you guys have been sending over on our Instagram about the last few podcast episodes. Thank you so much for that. For those of you who listen but you don't follow us on Instagram yet, definitely do so because we do post a lot of great English tips, content, giveaways all over there. So our Instagram is at glish, G-L-I-S-H, social, S-O-C-I-A-L. In this episode, I had a chat with Thomas from CozyGrammar.com. Thomas rediscovered the magic of words while living and working in Tamil Nadu, South India. Learning the Tamil language during this experience has given him what he calls the secret of poetry and has allowed him to return to the English language with a new ear and a newfound understanding. This has now led him to pursue work as an author, poet, translator, teacher, musician, and magician. That's a cool one. He also serves as a language consultant and teacher for Cozy Grammar, where he performs original shows. I think it's important to share how even native English speakers can have a journey with the English language too, and they can experience a newfound passion for it. Let's get into the episode. Hi, Thomas. Thank you for being a guest on the show. Uh, You certainly do have a lot of cool skills and accomplishments under your belt. Um, You're also big on traveling, which is super fascinating as you have lived in various cities and countries over the span of your life. So just to start us off and give us a little bit more, why don't you tell us about your background? Where did you grow up and where are you living now? So I grew up in Seattle, Washington. Um, and I actually live not far from Seattle, Washington, on an island called Vashon Island, which is just to the south uh, west of Seattle. You have to take a ferry, just a short 15, 20 minute ferry crossing to get to the island. So it's close enough that I'm, I'm close to my, my parents who still live in Seattle, but it's also a, a, a world apart. It's much more uh, rural and quiet here than it is, of course, in the city. What made you basically decide to go live and work in the south of India? Well, that's a great question. Uh, And in some ways, I didn't decide it. In some ways, it sort of happened uh, to me. Let me explain. When I was graduating from college, I wanted to learn another language because I, for a number of different reasons, hadn't really studied. uh, I mean, I had to study language in in high school and so on, but I hadn't studied it seriously. And I thought, you know, I want to correct this. Um, And I thought I would learn Spanish. And I thought I would go to Mexico. Mm. I applied for a a grant to go to Mexico. I wanted to go to the south of Mexico where I had a friend and mentor. And I wanted to learn Spanish. And I wanted to uh, learn from and with some of the indigenous communities in uh, the state of Oaxaca. Wow. And I was a finalist for that fellowship. And it totally fell through. And I thought my life was over. (laughs) But uh, this other opportunity arrived to uh, do something similar, but it would be in South India. I would be there for two years and I would be studying uh, the Tamil language and also teaching at a, at a university, at a college, teaching English. And interestingly, I had, since I was a child, been interested in India. Any time in school I had to write a report on a country, I always chose India for, for a number of reasons. I'm not exactly sure why, um, except that I can say that it was a country that had fascinated me for a long time. So with some trepidation, but also some excitement, I went to live in South India and I, I, that fellowship turned out to be a two and a half year that was extended. And then I became, um, because during that time I became quite involved in life there, I continued to go back, spent almost uh, more than a total of five years in South India studying Tamil more deeply and also living in a village uh, outside of the city of Madurai in Tamil Nadu, where I was basically adopted as one of uh, one of the villagers. Wow, I can't believe that. So five years. And so you said you had a fascination with India beforehand, but did you know anything about, you know, any of the Indian languages or about the culture? I knew a little bit. Um, and I had studied, when I was in college, I had studied uh, Indian religions, not as my major, but as one of my sort of, uh, as part of a, not a minor course of study, but alongside everything else. Uh, and so I'd studied uh, Indian history, I'd studied the history of Indian um, religions, and it also learned a little bit about Tamil, but not with any uh, awareness at the time that it would have such a, a big role to play in my life after graduating. There's one other piece to the story of how I ended up in South India. I met a wonderful teacher named Dr. K.V. Ramakodi, and and he was the person who really uh, enabled me to be able to speak and then later on to read and write in Tamil. 
And one night, this is about the first month that I was in South India studying with him. And, and when I would study with him, we would always eat something first and then study, or we, we would study and then eat something together. Sometimes we didn't even study, we just <laughs> ate if it was a festival day or, or some, some uh, special occasion. And one, one day we were sitting on the floor in his house eating this wonderful food that his wife, my Amma, prepared. And he suddenly looked up and said, a year ago, did you imagine that a year from now you would be living in Tamil Nadu, studying Tamil with me? And I said, well, no, sir, I had no idea. In fact, I had no idea even just a couple months ago. And he sort of smiled to himself and then he said, well, this is what in our tradition we call fate. Wow. And then he continued eating his dinner. <laughs> just like that. <laughs> so, <laughs> just just like that. Just a couple wise words. Just a couple wise words. Um, but there was a, 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 a sense of, I don't know, fatedness may be too grand a word in English, but, but a sense of um, a rightness to uh, not only meeting him, but also the chance that I had to, to live in, in that part of the world and to, to learn Tamil. Yeah, it totally happened for a reason. Yeah. So what was really hard about living there in India? Was there something maybe about the language or was there an aspect that for you was pretty difficult? Well, Tamil is a, a language which is quite distinct from English. Uh, and so it was quite difficult for me to learn as somebody who had grown up only basically with English. But I also learned something um, that was even more difficult than just sort of the task of learning the language, which was I came to experience for myself what it feels like not to be able to express yourself. Mm. Um, I had the very distinct sensation of not really being able to be me because I couldn't tell my stories. I couldn't explain quirks about myself. Yeah, you're not really the same. I'm not really there somehow. It's hard. It's hard to express yourself. Yeah, and it's a, and that process is very difficult. Yeah. Uh, and, and so all the more rewarding when I finally was able to begin expressing myself and going beyond, you know, day-to-day -day things to more sort of philosophical or personal kinds of wow. conversation. I, I totally relate with that because, you know, when you're speaking in a second language, in my case, it's French, you are kind of a little bit of a different version of yourself because, as you mentioned, you're a bit more diluted. It's kind of hard to have every aspect of yourself show, you know, and especially when you want to have those deep and really connected conversations, you kind of lack the vocabulary. So you kind of end up being mistaken as someone you're not. So I think I definitely feel that. Um, so clearly you are able to thrive because you were there for five years and, you know, you have such good stories and experiences about it. So you're able to thrive in these new environments. Do you have some kind of tip or some trick that allowed you to adapt so well and become so fluent in Tamil? Well, one of the things I learned was that, that if I thought of my task as learning, as, as becoming fluent in Tamil, I would be quickly totally overwhelmed mm -hmm. because there seemed to be an unending supply of words to learn and grammatical constructions to master, et cetera, et cetera. But I think it's more true to say, and this was very um, helpful when I began to think of it this way, was that I was becoming fluent in certain situations. Mm. And so I could think instead of, of becoming fluent in a language, becoming fluent in different languages. What I mean is becoming fluent in the language of um, greeting someone or being coming, becoming fluent in the, the, the situation of, say, uh, talking about the weather, to take very simple examples. But the same thing right. applies to having a deeper conversation. You know, there's certain kinds of conversation that bring with them a certain kind of vocabulary. So if people are discussing politics. There's the language of politics. If people are discussing uh, sort of philosophical or spiritual matters, that brings with it its own vocabulary. So as soon as I began to think of becoming fluent in situations, things became much easier because I was looking at it differently. I wasn't looking at the whole thing. Mm -hmm. I was looking at, okay, here's the situation. What do I need to learn to be able to navigate this situation? And of course, this wasn't, you know, this was language, but it was also, in that case, it was culture. It was, you know, body language as well as the words that I might say with my mouth and so on. 
Yeah, you know, that's a really authentic way of learning the language because you're really imagining each exact situation rather than just like you mentioned grammar and just like context where it doesn't really apply to your everyday life. So I think that was actually a good strategy. It was very, it, it, it took a lot of weight off my shoulders. It wasn't, you know, I, it's like, mm-hmm. you know, I could look at the dictionary and think, oh golly, I got to learn all this. <laughs> or I could look at what are those situations that I want to be able to move with people in. Yeah. And focus on those. I mean, this is one of the things I actually admire about Glish is I was noticing how you've structured your um, lessons around specific situations. Yeah. Um, because that's where <laughs> the the practical, uh, the, the practical application of language and the practical joy of learning a language um, really comes to the fore. For sure. And, you know, there's so many words where, yes, it's great to know them and it will be useful if you're already at that advanced level and you want to continue to, you know, improve your vocabulary. But when it comes to just having those basic first steps of a conversation and getting that confidence, you really only need to perfect being in situations, perfect the conversational aspect. So that's kind of what we do at Glitch. We, we don't really, you know, beat around the bush. We try to just get to the real points of learning yeah. language. Well, you know, that reminds me of one other tip that I would add, which is that when you're first learning a language, it can be helpful to focus exactly, like you say, on those words that are most um, relevant to us, that are most current. In fact, yes. when I was learning Tamil for the first time, my teacher basically instructed me in what he thought would be the sort of uh, the key vocabulary for getting around. It was about 2,000 words, um, which may seem like a lot unless you're breaking it down to smaller pieces. Um, But that once you have that base vocabulary, you also gain uh, a sense of confidence. You also gain the ability to, maybe you can't say exactly what you want to say, but you know enough words now that you can sort of suggest what you might be getting at. And then you might learn another word because you're talking with someone, they say, oh, well, you mean this. And then now you know the specific word you needed for your circumstance, rather than having picked it out of some abstract um, context less study, uh, which I suppose has its place. Um, But for me, the art of learning language and the joy of learning language uh, is really about connecting with people. 100%. And it kind of gives you those training wheels, you know, so you're not just out in the open and falling on your butt. So you have those little safety guards to allow you to start having the conversations and then you can slowly remove one wheel at a time. Totally. Um, So, you know, I'm really interested because this is amazing to me that you were able to become so fluent in such a complex language. So uh, when you did awaken your newfound learning for Tamil and just the appreciation for being there, how did that affect your English language? How did that affect your native tongue? That's that's another wonderful question. I, um, at the time that I was learning Tamil, I really wanted to be able to speak with people. I wanted to be able to live in a village. So I was very much focused on sort of the practical aspect of the language. Um, But one day my teacher said, okay, you know, we need to learn poetry as well. I want you, in fact, well, he wanted me to learn to read and write. And then along with that came the task of learning poetry. Wow. And he had me begin, of all things, with a 12th century Tamil woman poet and saint (laughs) named Abbayar. And he had me memorize the poems. And because enough time had passed since the poems were originally written, I didn't, I I, I couldn't understand the poems directly yet. I mean, they're not very difficult poems, but it, I was still on that, that journey in that process. Right. But memorizing the poems, something began to happen. Because I couldn't worry about the meanings, I could only worry about the sounds of the words, the pronunciation. And I started to hear that the poems had a rhythm to them. They sounded good. The play of the vowel sounds and the consonant sounds, um, there was a music to the words. There was a music to the language. And that, to me, was a great turning point because it awakened, or I should say reawakened, an awareness of of words and of language, not simply as meanings, which of course they do carry, but also as a form of music, an enjoyable um, sensation, the artistic appreciation of language, if you will. Maybe maybe even that's too fancy a word. Um, Maybe just the enjoyment of language as sound as music that we are singing to each other all the time. And so when I returned to the United States and I returned to English, I was able to hear English in a new way. I was um, much more alive to the rhythms of the language, much more alive to the sounds of the words. And in fact, I was able to read poetry in English, which I had never been able to 
really enter, not as an adolescent at least, or even in my early 20s, that poetry had seemed like some sort of obscure or, you know, needlessly academic sort of thing. Even though I knew that people loved it, I just didn't, I couldn't see what they were seeing. I couldn't, uh, perhaps to put it more appropriately, I couldn't hear what they were hearing. And so as I began to hear new things in the language, I found myself uh, reconnecting with a love for, of language and of words that I'd had uh, all along, um, especially as a child, discovering language, my, you know, my first language for the first time. But I had a chance to sort of bring these things together in a new way as a, as a young adult. Nice. It kind of heightened your senses, you know, yes. um, when you take something away, right? It gave you the chance to explore things that were already within you. Yes, it, it most definitely did. And so with this new found awakened appreciation for the English language and just all aspects of language learning, how did this now kind of shape where you are today? What about your career and basically the way you live your life? Well, it was a pivotal um, experience because when I returned that first time after two and a half years in Tamil and in Tamil Nadu in South India, I, I realized that what I what, what I wanted to do in, in one uh, in, in several senses, what I had always wanted to do was to to write, to be a writer, although I kind of sort of pushed that idea to the side for a period. And so coming back, I was able to embrace that wholeheartedly with a much deeper appreciation of what that would mean. So I began what has turned into a 20-year apprenticeship to language, to, uh, well, to Tamil, which I've continued to study, but also to English, which I've also continued to study, as well as to Spanish, and to uh, a, a daily practice which involves reading and which involves writing. Um, and now I have several books published and several more in the works. Uh, so, in fact, my writing life grew and has grown directly out of that experience of, of living in South India and of learning Tamil. And it has also uh, affected my, my work as a, or I should say it has also helped nourish my work as a teacher and as a performer. Over the years, I've taught in various capacities. In, in South India, I was teaching. Um, I've tutored. Uh, and now I'm part of something called Cozy Grammar, which is uh, a series of language arts video courses online. Uh, and I bring to that teaching not only my experience of, of working with words every day, of being a writer, but also my experience of learning a language that was totally different from my own and being able to see even my own language, even English, as being new even foreign, if you will, so that I can look at it with that freshness that I think learning asks of us. And then in my work as a performer, I, I combine poetry and um, stage magic, as well as story and song in different kinds of performances, solo performances, as well as uh, group performances. Uh, there too, I bring uh, all of that experience. And in fact, those performances often are growing directly out of that experience of being reawakened to language and to the magic of words, if you will. Yeah, I actually took a look at Cozy Grammar and guys, it's really cool what they're doing. It's super, super creative. I've never really seen English being taught in such a different way. You're right that it does bring a very performative, creative, poetic aspect to it. So I think that's really cool what you're doing. Do you guys have like a target audience of who the courses are for or just, yeah, like is there some kind of age group? Who are you targeting? That's a great question. There are, are several different groups or d several different audiences that we found really respond to the courses. One group uh, are homeschoolers or, or, or students who are now learning from home um, mm -hmm. uh, who find being able to work through a course at their own pace um, to be very uh, uh, helpful and nourishing even. And uh, as you mentioned, one of the things that we're really excited about with the courses is that ever since I've been uh, become involved with them, I've had a chance to really bring uh, the learning of grammar or punctuation to show how that connects to creative writing. Because these things, you know, grammar is often presented as or is often seen as a kind of dry, yep. boring, abstract, stultifying subject, which has nothing to do with creativity. But as a writer, I'm always thinking about grammar. I'm always thinking about how our knowledge of the structure of a language, which is really all that grammar is, how that allows us to be um, more creative, in fact, more adept in our ability to, to write stories and to write poems and to share our thoughts. 
Okay, well, you know what, Thomas, that's really, really inspiring. And I thank you so much for sharing your story with us at Glish and on the English Journey podcast. Um, I will be sure to link everything that Thomas talked about, guys. It will be in the description box, as well as his website and his work with writings. So I hope you guys enjoyed the episode and be sure to subscribe so you can receive our weekly episode straight to your device. If you are interested in sharing your own English journey, just like Thomas did here today, head over to glish.me and fill out the form down on our podcast page. I'm really excited to hear from you and you can follow us on Instagram for daily English vocabulary, idioms, words, and grammar. That is at glish social. Thanks guys and take care of yourselves. Bye.